So welcome everyone to today's Asian Impact Webinar on Trade, Investment, Climate Change in Asia and the Pacific. Actually, um, ADB re report with the same title uh, was just recently published last week in Singapore as part of our Asian Economic Integrity Report 2023, an annual flagship publication. As we all know, it's uh, quite difficult to think of the Asia's development economic growth story without considering the crucial role of international trade and foreign direct investment, uh, which have underpinned the region's industrialization and the incorporation into global value chain under the fast expanding the globalization process. But this should have uh, come also at a significant environmental cost in the form of increasing CO2 emissions um, during the process of the production of goods and services. In the basic macroeconomic model, exports are, in a sense, leakages from domestic production after consumption investment and government expenditure, and imports are injection into an economy to be used as part of domestic consumption investment and government expenditure and inputs into the exports. So in the meantime, FDRs are to make up for shortages in domestic investment and the capital formulation. So viewed from a similar context, an economic CO2 emissions exports are leakages from carbon emissions from domestic production and CO2 emission imports are an injection into the domestic consumption of CO2 emissions. So while the international trade closes the gap between the domestic demand and consumption, um, the CO2 emissions also uh, move across the borders embodied into the exports and imports. So we'd like to view uh, the region's carbon footprints uh, of the trade investment from the angle of the broad division of labor in production activities between the region versus the rest of the world. So in this juncture, at this juncture, we are very glad to have this timely webinar by inviting experts from relevant fields building on our flagship report and uh, I expect we are going to have a very interesting panel discussions in a moment. Before that, I'd like to ask my colleague, uh, Roland Abendano, the economist at the Economic Research and the Regional Interrogation Division of Economic Research and Cooperation Department uh, to make a brief presentation to set the stage for the panel discussion, which will follow. Uh, Rolando, you have the floor. Thank you, Jungu, and um, thank you for the introduction. And um, so let's start perhaps with uh, a video summarizing the key messages of our theme chapter. Please go ahead. Asia and the Pacific is on the front line of climate change with high exposure to extreme weather and many people living in low-lying coastal areas. Almost 40% of disasters worldwide have occurred in Asia and the Pacific. With its rapid expansion of production capacity, Asia has become the major producer and exporter, serving growing global demand. Asia is also a net exporter of carbon dioxide emissions. The region's rapid economic growth and industrialization has increased CO2 emissions, despite the carbon-reducing effects of technological advancements. The region needs to embrace climate-smart policies to ensure trade and investment can be part of the climate solutions. Policymakers can focus on four pillars, promoting trade in environmental goods and services, nurturing green businesses, enhancing international cooperation on regulations, and developing carbon pricing mechanisms. Environmental goods and services such as solar panels, wind turbines, and wastewater technologies can help use resources more efficiently and reduce environmental impacts. International and regional cooperation is essential for the development of a green and sustainable trading system. It's crucial to ensure that certification systems are interoperable and that regulations are coherent. It's also important to strengthen collaboration on a green economy through trade agreements, investment treaties, and other initiatives. While considering border carbon adjustments mechanisms, governments must carefully calibrate the impacts. Economies in the region need to be prepared for a changing trade environment. 
Ultimately, the most efficient measure for reducing carbon emissions and carbon leakages across borders is to foster international carbon markets. <laughs> to discover more, read the latest Asian Economic Integration Report. Thank you. Um, as we could see from the video, and uh, as John Wu highlighted uh, in the introduction, the Asia's global demand might not have been met without the expansion of production, increasing as a result carbon emissions. Asia's position as a net exporter of carbon emissions puts the region in the front line of climate change. And this is the focus of our chapter. We see that the transition into a more services-driven economy, a structural change, cleaner technologies will help to reduce the carbon footprint. But as international trade and investment continue to be key drivers in Asia's economic development, their policies more be, must be more aligned with the climate action. So these key uh, policies that we just saw in the video are the ones that we will examine and we will discuss in our panel discussion. So carbon emissions are the largest contributor to, cl to climate change, accounting for nearly three quarters of uh, total greenhouse gas emissions. And as the gap between the domestic production and demand is closed by the international trade, carbon emissions move across borders embedded in exports and imports. And as mentioned at the beginning, that is the basis of our analysis. So we have used carbon emissions embodied in production and international trade produced by OECD, which allow us to estimate the production and demand-based carbon emissions in this chart. So this is what we see. And what we observe first is a rapid increase over the past two decades in terms of carbon emissions with a more moderate growth in recent years. The region's remarkable growth has been driven by manufacturing and also increased by consuming less carbon emissions than produce. We continue to be carbon exporters. Next slide, please. As economic growth tends to be followed by carbon emissions, we need to uh, normalize or take into account economic size to compare regions. In this chart, uh, we normalize carbon emissions by using GDP for export and imports. And what we see is that in terms of carbon emissions intensity, it has de declined significantly in recent years. Uh, thanks to emission uh, reducing technologies, stricter regulations, awareness of environmental impacts, they have all contributed to this development. Besides the economic size and other uh, factors, we also see that the industrial structure is very important. We classify economic sectors uh, depending on their contribution to carbon intensity, and we observe two things. First, as we observe on the left, when services uh, are considered, they tend to produce less carbon emissions, which suggests that Asia's uh, reliance on manufacturing tends to contribute to a higher footprint for the region. Also, we see that the most carbon intensive and more carbon intensive uh, tend to be um, in Asia compared to other regions, uh, for example, European Union and North America. In other words, the industrial structure leans more towards a carbon intensive sectors compared to these regions. Regardless of the classification, it becomes clear also that in the case of trade, Asia hosts more FDI from carbon intensive industries, mainly led by East Asia and Southeast Asia with investments in manufacturing, trade, oil extraction and utilities. So this is a pattern we, we observe in both trade and FDI in terms of allocation of carbon intensive industries. At the sectoral level, what we see also is that there is a high heterogeneity and that the carbon intensity of sectors varies substantially among economies and among sectors. And we, it, we see indeed that for some sectors, Asian economies tend to be less carbon intensive than other economies. It's the case for Brunei, Darussalam, and Cambodia, for example, in basic metals, where they tend to uh, have lower emissions than some or most OECD economies. So this, the, the main point of our report is really that the, with the right mix of policies, trade and investment can be part of the, of the solution. And this was uh, presented in the video. So let's look more in detail at some of these measures. The technological environment, uh, technologies have improved significantly and the price of renewables has fallen uh, dramatically with other energy sources, including coal, expected to be more expensive in the next state. 
And if we look at the APEC list of environmental goods, Asia has accounts for more than 40% of trade in these goods globally, but the share uh, in terms of environmental services tends to be low. So there are a lot of positive effects of environmental goods and services for improving access to technology. And uh, this stresses the need to lower unilateral barriers, to have common de definitions of environmental uh, goods and services, and also to define better platforms to uh, negotiate and also reduce uh, tariffs and barriers to environmental services. Next slide. The second point we made is about uh, green businesses. And there are a lot of efforts that have been done in the region to, to green businesses, including better regulations, market-based mechanisms and incentives, and also changes in management systems. We emphasize two key messages. One, that certification can be critical to inform how products contribute to, to, to mitigate uh, climate change. And there are many examples in the region that are developing certification systems that are adaptable and interoperable. And this is key if we want them to be and, for, and function across borders. So it is important to consider the design features and the implementation choices between these certification systems, if they are public or private, if they are voluntary or mandatory. All these aspects need to be considered. Also, we see that the change in management practices has been important and ensuring that these tools are reachable for smaller firms is still uh, needed. Even if we look at that a lot of Asian businesses account for most of the global ISO 14001 certifications, which are on management systems for environment, they are still very concentrated on a few countries and most in large firms. So there is broader scope for developing. The third message is on international cooperation, and we refer here mostly to regional trade agreements and investment uh, investment agreements. We see that uh, despite the, the, the inclusion of more environmental and climate change provisions, they are still not well aligned with the decarbonization agenda. Less than 10% of um, bilateral investment treaties include some form of climate change references. And in, actually, in this case, the treaties tend to divert investment towards climate risky projects or even provide protection or insurance to these industries against climate action. So going forward, we need to strengthen these provisions. And also we have to have model agreements and mechanisms that allow the inclusion of substantial standards and environmental protection into these. Also, we can consider the new agreements such as the Green Economy Agreement developed by um, Singapore and Australia, which offers a kind of a frontier knowledge in terms of what type of agreements will be important in terms of um, climate mitigation and decarbonization policies. And we can consider this as options in the future to be part of the international cooperation agenda. And finally, on the topic of carbon pricing, which we will discuss more in length in the panel, we, we see carbon pricing as part of the global change architecture, and we still need to seize the momentum. So we, we see that there have been developments in terms of border carbon adjustment mechanisms, and they will have um, implications for, for the region. Uh, we see that while well, Asia is less exposed than other regions, some subregions could be much more exposed, for example, South Asia or the Pacific. Pacific due to the lack of a, a carbon pricing mechanism and lower statistical capacity. In the end, the global pricing mechanism should be the long-term goal to address the carbon leakage. And uh, in the end, we need to support these uh, mechanisms, in particular, what we see with the momentum of Article 6 and the bottom of approaches of Article 6.2 that are developing and that we will discuss more in detail. There are also a lot of other modalities that uh, include uh, the regional carbon and market alliances and the linking of emission tra trading systems, which are also gaining momentum and which should really seize the momentum in the region to contribute and in the long term aim at fostering an international cross-border carbon market. Let me stop here and thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Rolando. Thank you very much. Um, it was quite uh, concise, but it has provided a lot of food for thought for the panel discussion we are going to have uh, soon. 
Um, so let me first introduce our esteemed three panelists. The first, um, the Pramila Kriveli uh, is an economist at the Economic Research and the Regional Cooperation Department of Asian Development Bank. Her main fields of specializations are applied econometrics, international trade policy, regional trade agreement, um, and the trade negotiations, rules of origin, and non trade measures, and the geographical indications. Um, our second panelist, uh, uh, who is the uh, Virender Kumar Dugar, uh, is the, the principal climate change specialist of, of ADB, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department. And VK uh, leads uh, ADB's work to support its developed member countries use uh, carbon pricing instruments as part of their broader climate policy architecture uh, to achieve their nationally determined contributions and contribute to meeting the Paris Agreement goals. In this role, uh, he spearheads ADB's trust funds and mobilizes carbon finance to incentivize investment in low carbon technologies through bilateral international carbon markets. Last but not least, um, Liun Zhang uh, is a research fellow in economics at the University of Birmingham, UK. Uh, she studies firms' internalization strategies, exporting, importing, after and outsourcing, and the complex relationship between economic activity and the environment impact of environmental regulations on firms' choice of location, trade investment, and innovation, and the impact of these activities on the local and global environment. So we are uh, very glad, very pleased to be joined by these uh, three experts from the relevant fields. So let me first start with uh, Pramila. Um, so the Rolando presentation has highlighted the importance of the regional trade agreements uh, in supporting the greener trade. So do you agree with this uh, premise? And if so, the, between the mega regional trade agreements and bilaterals, uh, which are more likely to help uh, further uh, in greening the trade? And uh, what uh, are other avenues could be possible to strengthen the international cooperation on climate change front? Over to you, Pramila. Thank you very much, uh, Jonggu. Thank you for um, all the participants for listening to this webinar. So uh, about your question on regional trade agreements, how can regional trade agreements support greener trade? Well, I would answer that they can foster greener trade through various channels, uh, including the provisions on, on environment, on climate change mitigation, but also the provisions on trade facilitation. And in fact, regional trade agreements have increasingly acknowledged the importance of environmental sustainability and the, have in fact already uh, the, um, contributed to liberalize and removing barriers to climate friendly goods and services. So facilitating also the, adop the adoption of green technologies. And because of our environmental provisions are sometimes complemented by provisions on alternative energy or natural transition goals, trade agreements can also outline areas for climate mitigation. About trade facilitation, um, the main potential relies on the reduction, uh, the reduction, uh, reduction of waiting time at the ports and border crossing points, and therefore you reduce the transport congestion and uh, green gas house emissions. Now, so you have a, a wide potential for trade agreements to promote greener trade, but uh, it's also important to keep in mind that more efforts are needed to strengthen the regional trade agreements uh, greening function uh, through broader and deeper commitments. Uh, because the current provisions uh, in Asian R RTAs, regional trade agreements, are limited in scope and also in depth. And um, I think looking ahead, it's important to expand the your coverage depth but also to include um, provisions or elements on implementation and enforcement matters, because it will be quite useful to ensure that your effectiveness in achieving climate goals. And economists could also consider incorporating separate chapters on regional trade agreements, um, such as um, what we have in what we call deep trade agreements, uh, and that would be maybe useful to have all the provisions, you know, concentrated in one chapter. Now, you asked the question about mega regional versus uh, bilateral agreements. Well, just comparing um, the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, and the CPTPP, uh, you already have a, it already signals the fact that 
um, the size of the agreements does not really matter in the effectiveness of the agreements to you know, promote climate action. Because if you compare the two, both are mega regionals and the CPTPP has set really high standards in the area of environmental protection and climate change. But you have a chapter on environmental uh, on environment that is chapter 20 uh, with the objective to promote sustainable development um, um, and trade and environment policies and to achieve higher levels of environmental protections. And uh, in our step, in contrast, you have uh, only some guideline principle with two mentions of sustainable development, but not even more specific than, than that, sustainable development in the preamble. So you see that basically two mega regionals have really achieved totally different results. So basically I would say that in general, mega trade deals are difficult to negotiate. So it might not be surprising that it's difficult to include some provisions, uh, environmental provisions, but the outcome depends more on the different uh, level of development of the countries, because in RCEP, you have countries at really different stages of development and different you know, policy objectives, where CPTPP might have countries that are more similar and have more uh, similar interests. And lastly, uh, you asked about what are other avenues for possible uh, cooperation? Well. RTA regional trade agreements are only one way, one mode of cooperation, but of course, uh, there are many other modes of cooperation. For example, it is very important to promote um, mutual recognition, either automatic mutual recognition, if we can achieve it, and if not, we can try to have at least mutual recognition agreements of certification systems. So this is separate of regional trade agreements, but it's uh, an area of cooperation that is extremely uh, important because uh, basically um, you can uh, significantly lower the, the trade cost and regulatory burden to, to trade environmental goods. And so this is why it's, it's very, very important. And more generally, there is a wide range of new modalities of international cooperation. Uh, ranging from simple joint statement uh, initiatives or jo joint statements of intent to uh, much more advanced uh, agreements such as green, ec econom uh, green economy uh, agreements. So um, while some are not binding, not legally binding, such as memorandum of understanding or joint statement initiatives, they are also low cost in terms of bureaucratic resources and also uh, they are low risk and easy, easy to negotiate. So they can be signaling uh, the, some industries or jurisdictions uh, willingness to promote environment and climate change protect, um, um, provisions, but they can also be a stepping stone towards more ambitious collaborations with legal, legally binding agreements. And um, so I believe all forms of collaborations are, are valid, uh, but of course the green economy agreements um, are the most advanced and maybe in the long run, this is where we can uh, aim at. Uh, for example, um, the, the most striking example is the one between Singapore and uh, Australia. And uh, I think um, it, is, it is probably the future of international uh, cooperation in the area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pramila. Thank you very much. You have covered the various uh, important issues um, about uh, uh, regional trade agreement. Uh, first, we have highlighted the importance of trade facilitation in reducing the waiting time at the ports and the border crossing points, and also uh, in many cases, some environmental and the climate change related provisions are staying at the level of making some symbolic announcement but uh, how to ensure the implementation, actual implementation and enforcement mechanism could matter more than making just uh, uh, announcement uh, type of approaches. So, and also you have rightly mentioned that um, instead of uh, making a voluminous uh, agreements, uh, the breadth and depth of the commitment uh, could be more important. And also lastly, there are a lot of the uh, opportunities available, including the mutual recognition arrangement, MOUs, and also even further the green, green, green economy uh, arrangement, uh, which are all available for the policymakers in the region to seize the momentum with. Uh, with that, I'd like to move on to the Leon. Um, 
understand the energy transition, in particular, just energy transition is a buzzword at the moment, and there is a quite a high priority among the many Asian economies, given the important uh, com uh, contribution of the sector to carbon emissions. Uh, based on your research, research experience and knowledge accumulated in this field, what is the potential of the foreign direct investment to accelerate the energy transition agenda in Asia? And uh, what kinds of FDI policies can be more effective to support energy tra uh, transition across the board? Bium, over to you. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you, Jung Wu. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um... So uh, thanks for the invitation and yeah, for the question as well. So um, yeah, um, so uh, we all know China, uh, sorry, yeah, I'm Chinese, <laughs> it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Asia needs a lot of uh, energy for its uh, development. And we all know energy use contribute to uh, carbon emission. So uh, yeah, as I just mentioned China, so uh, China itself burned half of the uh, worldwide uh, coal consumption in 2021. And um, the cost, uh, fossil fuels, including coal and gas, uh, accounted for over 70% of the country's whole energy uh, consumption in 2021 as, uh, as well. So, and then uh, for the Asian country uh, economies, renewable energy, just accounted for like a step five or seven percent of renewable energy of, for all the uh, energy uh, it uh, the uh, the region consumed. So yeah, that's why you meant, you said energy transition is a priority for many of the countries. So then, how FDI can help? So FDI brings not only the investment. But more importantly, the uh, technology transfer. Let me give you an example how uh, FDI can accelerate the energy transition in this region. So China promoted, started to promote its uh, solar panel in early 2000. But uh, for the early, uh, for the next 10 years, the development was so slow. Actually, many um, manufacturing, uh, man, uh, the products manufactured in China, including solar panels and other related products, were exported to the US and the EU. The reason why uh, China didn't utilize all the uh, equipment uh, produced it's because of the lack of the domestic uh, market. And the main reason is the technology. So we have uh, the, the start, sorry, it's, I don't want to go to the uh, technology point because I'm not an expert, but we can uh, assume it, it requires lots of uh, technology and then and also, it, it's a huge investment. So that's why this, and then the uh, energy price at that time was too high, very high. And then the technology of this uh, solar energy connecting to the national grid, it's also a, a challenge. And then later on from 2009, um, the, the countries um, invested uh, more in, uh, and implemented uh, quite more, like at least 20 related um, solar, panel, solar energy development policies to encourage the development of uh, solar energy generation. And then uh, another policy relating to FDI is, um, so China relaxed, uh, gradually relaxing the uh, in restriction of a, uh, a few, sorry, uh, yeah, among these uh, four, around 400 um, sectors, 
China gradually relaxing this uh, restriction in renewable energy sectors. So then uh, FDI comes, came in and technology brought in. Then from 2012, most of um, um, the chi Chinese uh, energy, uh, solar energy uh, industry expanded. So from this example, now, I mean now, yeah, uh, China has uh, around this uh, region, China added more renewable power than any other nation. So from this example, we can see policies uh, re encouraging in a foreign investment to renewable energy uh, sector will help the energy transition of the region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, very true that uh, Leon. So, uh, whenever we talk about the uh, impact, positive impact of FTI, we tend to think about from the during, and as I mentioned during my the, the opening remarks, that the FTI is to make up for the shortages in the domestic investment and the capital formulation. But as you have highlighted, uh, the importance of the technological spillovers, technology transfers embedded into foreign direct investment is a very crucial part of the FDI story and the FDI's positive impact. And in particular, in the solar panels, the wind turbines, and the energy transition into the renewables. Uh, going forward, I, I believe that the, the, the positive uh, impact of FDI will uh, become even more, even uh, much stronger, uh, So the, which can have a, a quite a significant implication for the developing economies in the region. Um, with that, let me now turn to the VK, uh, who is expert on the carbon uh, pricing and the carbon market mechanism. So as you know, VK, our report highlights the growing momentum on the use of carbon price pricing mechanism to reduce the carbon emissions in Asia. Uh, so uh, what do you think about this? I mean, how could these new instruments can influence the region's production pattern? If so, how should they be designed? To more effectively, efficiently reduce carbon emissions while maintaining the region's competitiveness. Over to you, BK. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this great question and directly linking it to our report. And before that, I'm thankful for, for you inviting me for this panel conversation, which is truly interesting. Uh, there is a big momentum for the use of carbon pricing as a part of the broader climate policy architecture worldwide. And the momentum is also pretty much same within Asia and the Pacific, and the countries are demonstrating that they aren't, they want to use carbon pricing to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions cost effectively. Um, within the region, countries are using both direct as well as indirect carbon pricing mechanism in different forms, including the use of international carbon markets. Uh, so, to to answer your question. Uh, the, the region has a lot of interest and a lot of experience in using carbon pricing. And the in the longer run, these carbon pricing measures are likely to shape up the, the economic structures, different sectors, and therefore the production patterns towards low carbon goods and services. Uh, the uh, but however, uh, I think we should we should not forget that uh, for us to see concrete evidence evidence of uh, how carbon pricing can uh, affect the direction or the composition of the production and services, the carbon prices, the price of the carbon needs to be substantially higher than uh, what they are currently within our region. And uh, in that context, it is important to note that setting the right level of price as well as providing a very well thought through ex exemptions of businesses to adjust the initial stages can help reduce GHG emissions while maintaining the region's competitiveness. It is very well known fact that when you uh, put on carbon pricing, especially the domestic carbon pricing, it can have distributional impacts. So the the real uh, uh, key thing here is how do countries or how do policymakers are able to contain those distributional impacts so that uh, the 
adverse impact, if any, on the local businesses or different uh, economic sectors are minimized, especially in the initial stages when such uh, carbon pricing instruments are being uh, introduced. So one of the one of the options countries actually take is to initially uh, introduce carbon pricing at a low level and ramp it up gradually as the industry and the different economic sector get more habituated, infrastructures build, there's a more awareness about it, and uh, the different sectors have taken their, their adaptation time. Uh, so we can, uh, uh, you know, you know, it was very interesting to, to listen to the comments made by the previous speakers. And I let me let me uh, jump in there saying that the, we can't talk about trade and investment without mentioning the emergence of the uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism that we have also captured in the publication you did mention in your your initial comments uh it is it is being uh, considered or thought about in different sectors uh but long and short from my side if if and when the the cbam uh, are implemented uh, exporting partners um exporting countries which have carbon prices uh, within their domestic jurisdictions actually stand a uh, higher ground in cushioning against the impacts of competitiveness simply because leakage concerns uh, that are usually talked about in the context of international movements of goods and services would have already been addressed by the domestic carbon pricing. So um, the 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 carbon uh, the the policymakers measures that uh, take into account the international factors such as the CBAM and a high demand for lower low carbon goods and services uh, will be critical in ensuring that the domestic carbon pricing mechanisms are designed in a fashion that maintains the competitiveness of uh, goods and services from the region. So I'll stop here. And, thank you, thank uh, you, yeah. Thank sure, you. Sure. Thank you, thank you, Vika, thank you very much. So yeah, I fully agree with you that um, uh, in theory, even in our report, we're highlighting the importance and crucial role of the carbon pricing mechanism which can enable uh, the, the incorporation of the climate cost into the production investment and consumption decision. But as you have rightly mentioned, the just simply introducing carbon price mechanism may not make the... Well, while John Wu uh, reconnects, I, I can, I, we had a follow-up question for BK, perhaps just to understand a bit better um, what about the, the evolution of voluntary carbon markets, which is a topic that is a very, very under discussion. Um, as I shared, is one of the topics being discussed currently in the APEC ministers process. There is a lot of interest from 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 OECD economies, uh, and we wanted just to to know from your perspective what what are the big areas where where things need to move in order to to foster and and to promote a bit more this BC, BCM in the region, which are still. Uh, are gaining traction, but they are still uh, perhaps not as 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 developed as as we would like to. So that was one follow up question we had for BK. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you for for uh, uh, asking this question on the voluntary carbon market is very interesting. Okay, let me let me start by saying that the Asia and the Pacific has always been the epicenter of international carbon markets, including the voluntary carbon markets. I think the audience would recall that the majority of the clean development projects under the Kyoto Protocol were actually hosted in Asia and the Pacific. And Asia and the Pacific also host the majority of the, the projects under the joint crediting mechanism initiated by the government of Japan. So the region has a, a great deal of experience and expertise uh, in uh, managing, developing and managing and successfully implementing the international carbon market projects. And uh, I think it is likely to remain so. For instance, carbon trading hubs for international markets are emerging in Singapore and Hong Kong. And uh, uh, oh, this is also also to, to highlight the fact that the uh, the region has uh, more than 50% of the global GHG emission, which gives the highest potential in terms of uh, 
mitigation actions and therefore generating carbon offsets. So uh, that is one, uh, one layer of my answer to this. The voluntary carbon markets, they have been uh, around uh, for a while, uh, the, but they, they started doing very significantly after the Paris Agreement rule book was adopted in COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, and this was uh, a due recognition of the fact that the large uh, corporates have started uh, to take uh, the the, uh, the carbon neutrality or net zero targets for for their own, uh, and that also kind of reflected in the delays in agreeing agreement on the Article Six rule book. Uh, that so therefore, um, looking at the vol voluntary carbon markets, uh, as the terminology says, there is not a standard pattern. So there are multiple. Uh, there are multiple carbon crediting standards within the voluntary carbon markets. Those make the market a bit fragmented and diverse. Say, for example, we have Vera standard, we have Gold standard, we have Climate Action Reserve, we have the American Carbon uh, Registry. So uh, the, all these standards do not have common guidelines and principles. This is one of the this is one of the challenges. And you know, even though there have been a recent attempts to agree on a common guidelines and principles through the Integrity Council for the VCM, and there are other initiatives, but still uh, these standards are uh, they are standalone and they have been you know they are quite diverse. There are se several other barriers that needs to be taken care of immediately. Uh, say, for example, how to how to um, assess the additionality uh, of uh, a mitigation action that could be um, that could be registered to get generate carbon credits. You know, uh, it is very important uh, to ensure that the emission reductions and the the carbon credits that are generated as a result of this are are real and would not have happened regardless. Would not have happened anyways. So this is very important element of the additionality. Uh, uh, just just as an example, you know. Uh, you probably would have heard about the forestry credits, which are being the, the epicenter of the controversy surrounding the voluntary carbon markets. So one way of ensuring credibility, uh, the, the additionality element, and therefore the credi credibility and integrity of the VCM, for example, is requiring crediting reference levels to be established in a way uh, such that it avoids the cherry picking reference period and inflated baselines. So basically making very conservative estimations of the credits that are being generated or emission reductions coming out of those individual mitigations. So common standards, uh, common standards, maintaining the high integrity, additionality, and also uh, efforts to make sure the avoidance of double counting, which is very important, which sits right at the center of Paris Agreement, where avoidance of double counting is very important because countries do have their NDC targets and any emissions reductions coming out into from the mitigation actions would have a place within the country's own registry system and make, make, making it possible for countries to count those uh, emission reductions toward their own NDC targets. So in that context, a clarity, a clear policy directive from the governments, how they are going to deal with this issue so as to avoid double counting. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Vika. Thank you very much. I, I would like to <laughs> apologize because there was some emergency fire alarm ringing inside my <laughs> unit. <laughs> so I hope is, going. Yeah, this is some of uh, uh, the doing the work from home. <laughs> Okay, so let me, uh, because the, in our previ uh, previous discussion, BK um, also discussed about the CBAM, uh, which is likely to be implemented by EU pretty soon. So let me uh, pose the same question to Leon. So given the growing challenges, which could be coming from the CBAM, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. So how developing economies in the region to be prepared to cope with the growing challenges in the future? Yeah. Thank you, Zhong Wu. Yeah, um, VK has uh, talked uh, quite <laughs> a lot about this ban. So uh, from my view, um, now at the moment, um, the um, Asia and Pacific region is not at a high risk at the moment because um, the EU is not the biggest uh, trade partner. But um, countries, especially the developing countries in Asia have a higher risk uh, level because they have they are less likely to have a diversified uh, exports um, mixed 
and they have higher, I mean, the products they export have higher emissions. And yeah, and then some of these, uh, quite a few of, uh, of these countries haven't implemented carbon price, uh, carbon tax or uh, ETS and they have like a less satisfactory uh, capacity. So these countries have higher risk. And how these countries can uh, navigate these uh, challenges, uh, VK and I think uh, Pamela uh, earlier uh, mentioned um, international and interregional cooperation. I think this is um, further cooperation in this region will, will help. So in terms of implementing the carbon price and linking their um, ETS for those who have developed or those planning to uh, develop, apply, uh, implement. So this carbon market alliance will help uh, these countries to preserve um, smooth flow of the goods and services while offering um, more opportunity to support their uh, economic integration. Uh, I will stop here. For, okay. yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Lin. Thank you very much. I, yeah, so in not only uh, to respond to the challenges coming from the CBM, but uh, even for the, the, the more efficient mechanism in reducing the carbon emissions, uh, many developed countries in the region need to introduce the carbon pricing mechanism. So given the, the long time horizon, uh, which, is, which will be required in the, having a full-fledged uh, mechanism of the carbon pricing, uh, many companies need to start now and then the ADB uh, will be supporting that kind of policy efforts uh, going forward on various fronts. Um, so let me turn to Pramila. So, um, because the one uh, solution in addressing the carbon footprint of the trade investment could be the fostering more trading environment goods and services, right? But uh, at the moment, uh, WTO level, international discussion had been stalled. And then, the, as we know, the APEC level discussions are moving forward. So do you think that the, this kind of venue can provide a promising stepping stone to forge a regional and global consensus on the lease and the, what kind of uh, more efforts uh, have, have to be made to promote trade in uh, environmental goods and services? Okay, over to you, Pamela. Thank you very much for, much for the question. So indeed, the promoting the trade in environmental goods and services is really, um, I, I would say, a, a key element in fighting climate change. But the negotiations, as you rightly mentioned, at the WTO have st stalled because of the complexity on agreeing on a definition on, on environmental goods and services in the first place. And in fact, uh, the discussions began in 20, uh, 2001, and uh, we had an agreement, environmental goods agreement in 2014, but then little has been achieved in this, on this front. Uh, but at the regional level, there were progresses with uh, APEC, as you mentioned. There, is, uh, there was the APEC, APEC Vladivostok Declaration on Environmental Goods, where members agreed to uh, limit to a 5% uh, tariff by 2015 on 54 environmental goods that were defined at the HS6 uh, level of the product, uh, the harmonized system uh, classification. And they are considered uh, classified in three categories, renewable energy produ uh, production, environmental monitoring, analysis and assessments, and also waste management and systems. But it's important to note that there are, no, um, there are few or no goods to manage energy efficiency and resource efficiency. But also the most important to note is that these commitments are in fact voluntary and not really enforceable. So even though recently APEC has also uh, considered adding 21 new environmental goods to the list, again, the adoption remains voluntary. So of course, further efforts are needed and not just to further agree on environmental goods, but uh, to expand this list, but also to add services and to also have a global value chain uh, approach where we could account not only for final goods, but also for raw materials, services, and intermediate inputs uh, that are in fact uh, traded and so that we can lower the barriers on those goods. 
Uh, again, as I mentioned, there are a lot of negotiation challenges and on definitions because, of course, defining the goods at the six-digit level, uh, it is based only on readily readily observable physical characteristics, so it can be quite ambiguous because it's difficult sometimes to link the good and its uh, environmental, you know, impact. So that's where also we will need more um, a better accounting system to know, you know, the carbon footprints of the trade of it type of goods and also in the production. But also the same goods defined at the HS6 digit level can be of dual use, like such a tank to store fossil fuel or green hydrogen. And um, so there are uh, various uh, challenges. The OECD has adopted another approach where they try to establish a list with, um, which is based on process and production methods, which might be more precise, you know, to link the goods and the environmental impact, but it's also burdensome uh, to prove. So there are pros and cons. And in the area of services, APEC is also open to, you know, as reaffirmed uh, recently, the commitment to fair tra uh, trade in environmental services. And the ministers have endorsed in 2021 a list on, of uh, environmental and environmental related services based on the CPC classification. Uh, but overall, to, to overcome the challenges you have uh, in negotiations, you can either think of unilateral liberalization, because basically it's a win-win situation to liberalize environmental goods. So some countries has, have started to liberalize unilaterally. So without negotiation, negotiating concessions, for example, the UK, when they uh, renegotiated the agreements after leaving the EU. Uh, and um, or you can have deep, deep regulatory collaborations with specific, you know, uh, a specific small group of like minded jurisdictions or countries with common uh, definitions of environmental goods. And also you can cover other elements that than environmental goods, such as other non tariff barriers, or even recognize the embedded uh, emission accounting. And lastly, you have targeted collaborations that are uh, more uh, specific on specific groups or industries. Okay, thank you, um, Pramila. Thank you very much. So at this juncture, let me uh, try to pick up one uh, question from the Q&A box, uh, which is, the, what is the main reason of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in trade? What is new technological innovation and approach in trade uh, to reduce carbon emissions, what is the impact of this to the trade facilitation? Uh, this is uh, broadly uh, why, how the trade is linked to the greenhouse gas emissions, in what aspect, and what kind of technological innovation can help address this problem. So, any panelists who would you like to jump in? Yeah, sure. I, well, I will say um, um, energy and transportation are, are two big sources of, of the emissions at the moment, and a lot of the efforts are also on decarbonizing the, the transportation uh, chains. Um, so this is an important part of the of the agenda, also on looking at the composition, the energy mix in transportation, uh, mainly maritime transportation. That's why the cover of the books has a big ship, uh, because more than 80% of, of emissions come from maritime uh, transportation. So that's that's a big focus at the moment. And, and there are different initiatives in terms of the use of alternative fuels. And, and that's something we, we explore a little bit more in our report. I think that that would be uh, my answer to that question. Yeah, thank, thanks, Rolando. As I understand, around the 30% of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions are, are accounted for by the international trade in one way or another. And out of the 30%, around 21% is uh, related to the production. And uh, the remaining 9%, as uh, Rwanda has explained, uh, are coming from the, the transportation, including marine, marine transportation and air cargo, um, among others. So in discussing the how to green the international trade, we need to uh, focus both on the how to green the production itself, as well as how to uh, make the international transportation cleaner and the greener. So VK, would you like to uh, jump in? Yes, I you know since the question was what is the source of GHG emissions from international trade. One important another element, like you know, you uh, you alluded to about the production related. Uh, this is called leakage in the in the in the uh, in the nomenclature in the carbon markets. So when there is big there is a shift in the production from country A to country B simply because it become more competitive. 
there there's a source of ghg emissions also shifts alongside for example mm -hmm. if energy intensive steel manufacturing industry moves from country a to country b while the ghg emission profile of country a may go down the ghg emission profile of country b where this the steel manufacturing facilities have to be brought up to meet the international demand will eventually go up so this is one of the reasons uh mm -hmm. why why the GG emissions in, related to international trade are captured in the in the goods and services. Stop. Yeah, so how the greenhouse gas emissions moves across the borders through the carbon leakages and uh, and other channels. Uh, it's quite interesting and a very important topic for us to tackle in the future. So because you have um, jumped in on this topic, so let me briefly ask you as uh, for your final word. So because many people are quite interesting interested in the prospect of the COP28 because the price agreement was a milestone, key milestone, but in the future, what kind of the new initiatives or new promising discussion could be made through the COP28? Any uh, quick reaction on this? Okay, uh, I think with, with, with regard to the international carbon markets, mm -hmm. the, uh, there was a long delay in the in the on uh, in the agreement of rule book related to article 6 which lays down the foundation for the next generation of international carbon markets so the rule book as i mentioned earlier was adopted in cop 26 and further clarifications and some other additions also came out in cop 27 now i think the time is for countries to start operationizing article 6 and taking advantage of the mechanisms underneath so uh, you know the countries need to work over towards the readiness capacity building and that was one of the things that were agreed at the last cop and i think there's going to be further momentum and how to support countries to enhance their readiness to operationalize article 6 so i think this is where you know, the while the negotiators will come about and making for the momentum, supporting countries, countries will also need to take initiatives. Institutions like ADB will also be supporting its developing member countries to enhance their readiness to operationalize Article 6. So what it require is to help them to look at their policy framework, look at the institutional infrastructure, look at their capacity, help them conduct certain pilots, everything moving towards the single goal that how countries are able to uh, use Article 6 mechanisms, enter into some real-life transactions, facilitate the international flow of carbon finance, and how to use that carbon finance to overcoming some of the barriers that are very critical uh, for deploying advanced low-carbon technologies, helping countries to achieve their NDC target, and raising the ambition over a long period of time so a lot of lot of work needs to be done before countries are actually able to uh, to take advantage of article 6 mechanisms but this is the time for countries to actually go ahead and start implementing it and we as as a development partner we stand ready to support our developing member countries to enhance their readiness for the next generation of international carbon markets i'll okay. stop here yeah thank you thank you thank you Vicky, very much so Expectations remain very high, and I hope the policymakers will be able to live up to the expectation going forward. Uh, with that, uh, I think that we have come to the end of our uh, scheduled time. I think it has been a quite rich and fruitful discussion. Uh, so I'd like to thank the presenter, Rolando, and the three esteemed panelists very much for their insights and views. Um, before uh, we close today, um, to this webinar, we'd like to invite you all to join our next Asian Impact webinar on digitalization for gender equity to be held on the March 21st of 2023, Thursday via Zoom again. So please do check out the, the Asian Impact webinar page and the Chief Economist Twitter account for more updates. Uh, with that, thank you very much uh, once again for joining us today and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.